Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at NASA's John C. Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. We're here visiting Aerojet Rocketdyne's facilities, uh, and our trip here has been sponsored by the company, and we're honored to have with us one of the legends of American uh, aerospace, uh, Julie Van Cleek, who is the Vice President for uh, Advanced Space and Launch at the company. Uh, Julie, congratulations. You're now a fellow of the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics. What a great honor. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, we are uh, standing in front of an iconic uh, rocket engine uh, that powered America's uh, space shuttle fleet, uh, the RS-25, uh, about a 400,000 uh, pound, uh, if I recall. Four to five hundred uh, pound thrust uh, engine, uh, terrifically powerful. Three of them powered each one of the space shuttles. But now you guys are repurposing this, and I want to start off talking about the RS-25. What's next for the RS-25? To get into a discussion of sort of the kind of rocket engines and work you guys are doing uh, as you try to build on the sort of the tremendous historic portfolio of propulsion, uh, space propulsion you have as you go into the next generation. Okay, well, the RS-25 did power the space shuttle. There were three of them, and now we're repurposing it for the space launch system will be the new, um, we think, powerhouse launch vehicle for the United States, and we uh, will be planning to launch that vehicle in the 2019 timeframe. And there'll be four of these on the back end of uh, the SLS. Um, the first few flights will use engines that did fly on shuttle flights. And again, we'll be checking them out, putting a new control system on them, um, operating them a little differently than we did shuttle. So we're in the final uh, phase of qualifying those engines right now to make sure that they can you know, do that mission because it is different than the shuttle mission. And then we'll be, we're very excited. We'll be putting the engine back into production, only we'll be building it with modern, uh, more modern manufacturing techniques than we used when we first built these engines. These engines were state of the art uh, mm -hmm. throughout the, obviously developed in the 70s for right. the 1980s and used throughout the space shuttle program, always updated after each flight. Right. So there's a lot of new componentry and new technology, but the architecture itself is an older architecture. As a, 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 a rocket woman, mm -hmm. how would you be redoing this? What are the things you're gonna do differently to try to take cost out of it? Because today it's not so much about eking extra performance rather taking cost out of the out of the right. engines I mean we want to um, maintain the high performance it is the highest performing rocket engine I think uh, probably on the planet right now it's a pretty incredible engine um, so now our challenge is to maintain the um, performance and the reliability of the engine but bring down the cost because now it's going to be used in an expendable variant so a number of the things we're doing is we're building things differently we understand very well how the RS-25 um, operates, how it's built, etc. And now we're incorporating some new manufacturing techniques. Um, we're using 3D printing to build some of the complex structures, bring those costs down. We're manufacturing the nozzle in a different way. It's one of the long lead components. And looking for all those places that we can incorporate lessons learned from the past uh, several decades to bring down costs but not sacrifice the qualification history. So it's a uh, pretty exciting time to be doing this, to modernize this engine. And that's not unusual with what we do in the rocket industry. Once you have a high performing, very well operating engine, you continue to improve it and you um, focus on either higher performance or bringing down cost. Uh, and I think that it's uh, incredible, um, all the stress factors and dynamics that, that go into making a rocket engine or, or how quickly things can go, go very wrong, although you guys have a pretty good track record on that not happening. We have a very good track record. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you guys are justifiably proud of that. But let me ask you about um, the other sorts of, you know, AR-1 is under development. You guys are working on the J-2, I mean, J-2, a legendary engine that powered the second stage of the Saturn V, but now an updated and X version of that engine. Uh, you know, as long as you have some good stuff, it's always good to build on them. Talk to us about the portfolio of advanced work you guys are doing, both on the engine side, but also on the launch side, because you're also focusing on trying to take cost out of the launch infrastructure part of the equation as well. Yeah, we're working, um, I, I'm, I've got one of the best jobs on the planet too, because I get to work on both launch as well as space propulsion. So everything from the ground all the way to the final destination, be that a satellite, be it Pluto, whatever. I mean, I get, it, it's pretty cool. Um, relative to the things we're working on in the launch side, we're working on the AR-1, which is a, um, an engine that we're developing to eliminate this country's dependence on Russian engines. Um, it's a very advanced engine, again, focused on the most um, advanced manufacturing techniques this country has, as well as some of the really cool combustion things that we do. And that engine just completed CDR. Um, we're working on the upper stage that'll power both the SLS, that's an upper stage engine that's a derivative of the RL-10. 
We're working also on the in-space propulsion, and that's where some of the most advanced technology is really happening right now. Um, electric propulsion, nuclear thermal propulsion, ion propulsion, um, and also the power systems that go with them. So it's a, it's a good time to be in the rocket business. Space throughout your career, you know, we were talking about this uh, last night a little bit about mm -hmm. how, you know, when you got started in uh, 1981, if I mm -hmm. recall correctly, right. um, you know, that was a whole generation of Apollo. You still had Germans that you were working for yes, from the original cadre of German scientists uh, who helped form, you know, or were a key part of the American Corps rocket program. And there have been all sorts of fads, and it's the end of space, and we're going to go to fiber, and now all of a sudden space is really hot and cool again. Um, the dynamic in the environment is a very different one, and you guys are a historic, a heritage contractor with a lot of history behind you, but now there are new companies that are in it. SpaceX, obviously most prominently, uh, has made tremendous inroads in, in terms of convincing the government to give it support to get it started, looking at a different cost model. If you listen to Elon Musk, whether it's the cost per launch or the building of new launch facilities, that, you know, unprecedented low costs, uh, that's put pressure on everybody. Uh, you have got uh, Jeff Bezos and Alan uh, that are together doing Blue Origin, which, which is uh, another uh, company, a little bit even more secretive than SpaceX, but every once in a while is demonstrating some capabilities. As somebody who spent their life in this business, mm -hmm. you know, what, what kind of challenges does that impose on you? What's the kind of future you see? And how are you adjusting strategy um, to be able to compete in this sort of very different environment? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> um, well, there's been a lot of uh, cycles in this industry, and we've seen a number of trends where people want to do things different, and it's happened several times during my career. And through each, each time you go through a trend, probably something shifts a little bit in the industry, but you always come back to the basic physics of rocket engines, and you have to, those things don't lie, those things don't change. Um, what I'd say is there's a lot more excitement now in the industry than there has been, uh, which is a good thing. I think many of the new players are bringing more attention to the space program again, and that educates the public as to how important the space program is, uh, inspires the youth as to what can be done. So all those are very positive. I think a number of the um, new people, some of them have bigger dreams than others. Um, some of them are dreams that from our perspective look like Okay, there's probably a lot more work to be done than you think there. Um, but they, you know, as a, to be sustainable in this business, you're, you're, not, you're, you're gonna have to face those things. And some of them will make it and some won't, just like they had through the other cycles. For us, it's, you know, we never forget who we are. We, do, we um, mission success, um, both from the launch side as well as the space side is very important to us. And we don't take shortcuts there. And we're not gonna take shortcuts there. Um, if if there gets to be a point where people can accept rocket in, rockets blowing up on the pad, we probably, that, that's not acceptable to us. And so we will continue to do things we need to to maintain our identity. That said, we recognize some things are becoming um, maybe more uh, accessible to the public. We want to be doing these things more regularly. We have to try to bring the cost down. And we're very focused on that. We have a number of things that we do that in our manufacturing, in our processes, et cetera, that, that focus on cost. Um, and we do that as we evolve our products. I, I, I'm amazed at some of the pricing that people are talking about these days, and I have a feeling we're all going to, you know, end up in a little bit, they'll end up in a different place, we'll end up in a different place. Um, when it comes to, um, what I'm curious about is, how do you strike that balance? Because uh, rocket engineers are by, um, by definition and history very realistic, very data-driven, very precise, but also very wary of trade-offs that could end up costing you very, very badly, mm -hmm. um, given the tolerances are so incredibly, you know, if, if you think a Swiss watch is exacting, you don't know nothing compared to what's happening inside this thing when it's running. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you guys are making this trade-off to maintain the safety of flight and the surety of success, but also to try to take costs. I mean, you know, I would almost ask you, like, is the degree of engineering you guys are using today even more advanced than the degree of engineering you guys were using, you know, when you entered the business? Mm -hmm. um, I would say the engineering continues to evol evolve. And it's interesting when you talk about with the price, it's like, um, we take advantage of the fact that we have really smart engineers and, the, and, and we have very innovative people. They've been, they, 
the people that we have in the company have continued to advance and create new products throughout the entire time I've been there. It's, it's been amazing to watch and it's kind of a part of the culture and it's their identity. So, you know, I'll think about some of the more recent examples and what we do is we take advantage of their engineering discipline. We set new requirements and those requirements as opposed to the tradi traditional ones that the government would set, which would be more performance um, driven. We set the cost um, requirement and we don't just set the requirement, we measure them on it throughout all their reviews. And you'll see it, through, and at first they're like, well, we, we don't do it this way. And it's like, no, you're designing to these cost targets and these are the cost targets you have to get to. And it's been amazing to see the innovation that's come from that. It's, um, we've set things that we thought were beyond our capability and, and we're hitting them. And, uh, and there's gonna be a whole new generation of rocket engines because of that. Um, one of the other engines you have is the 68. Um, mm -hmm. There's going to be a, we're here, we're going to be seeing a, a test of that engine uh, as well as a pre-burn uh, test on the AR1, uh, which is uh, another heavyweight uh, engine you guys are, are developing. Um, talk to us a little bit about the 68 and where it fits in your portfolio because that engine also over time has been evolved to this newer generation, which is significantly the A, which is significantly more powerful than its predecessor. Yeah, that's a very high thrust engine and it powers the Delta IV infrastructure for the government. And that launches probably uh, some of our most important satellites, some very specialized satellites. I don't think there's another launch vehicle. There's certainly not another launch vehicle in this country that can do what that launch vehicle does. And it's, uh, I'm not sure if it's the most powerful in the world, but it's if not, it's it's one of the one of those. Um, it's, it's about seven hundred thousand pound yeah. thrust at this yeah. point, and north it's of again, that. Oxygen, hydrogen, so very high performing. Um, you know, kind of a cool engine, cool launch vehicle architecture, and that it flies with a single core as well as three cores strapped together, um, and the three cores are the ones that launch our very heavy lift um, payloads. Let me take you to Mars. Um, you know. Uh, there is so much activity. There was a Mars conference. Uh, we missed you at that, but we were on our way uh, down over here. But I know you spent some time there, and then it's going to be uh, continuing. It's a three-day summit that's uh, Humans to Mars that's going on at GW University. It's the fifth annual uh, summit. There's so much activity going on um, in terms of going to Mars. Walk us through how you guys are playing in that. There are design studies underway. There are actual programs that are underway. There are people who are locked in a facility for the full duration of an actual mission uh, to see what the psychological stress is, the human stress is. Can we put everything into one thing and nobody come out of there for the, for the entire, uh, entire duration? Talk to us a little bit about you know, this course because Mars you know, when it came to Goddard and Werner von Braun, they wanted to get to Mars. Like the moon was a, a step to getting to Mars. And that's something that's been a consistent theme as well that you've worked on on and off in your career. Talk to us a little bit about how you guys are supporting that overall Mars drive. Well, we've um, supported this country's Mars efforts since there were Mars efforts. You know, right now there've been a number of robotic uh, missions there and only the U.S. has been successful there, frankly. And um, we've we've had propulsion on every spacecraft that's gone to Mars as well as when they, they um, the when they landed the rover and it had the time of terror, those were our engines that had to work. So we had a time of terror and it was, uh, they all worked and, and we're very with proud the, of that. With a 90 minute delay. Yeah, we were all sitting there like, uh, you know, did they really work? But but they did and thankfully that w that's, a, that's been a great mission. So now as we look to humans, and we'll continue with the robotics because the robotics help really inform these missions and are a critical part of the overall, um, you know, architecture as you think about it. So a number of, ways that people are talking about going to Mars and, and we've got our every every prime contractor has their own ideas but they all have some basic themes you have to lift a lot of mass off the planet of the earth um, and that's why we think SLS is a, a critical part of the infrastructure and then you have to really think through the logistics of having people in space and having people in space a long time um, how they stay alive how they eat um, how you keep them safe um, do you stage them somewhere and then send them on to Mars do you use advanced propulsion to cut the trip time down or not? You know, so there's so many decisions that have to be made and there are many studies ongoing there. Um, you know, we're, we're working obviously on the rocket that we hope will be taking those people off the planet. We also provide the propulsion on the Orion capsule, which will keep them safe, you know, um, depending on what, what way we, we use uh, to get them there. And then we're working on those advanced propulsion that we mentioned earlier about um, ways to decrease the trip time or make the propulsion more efficient so you can get the many tons of material you're going to need to get to Mars. And so um, we'll, be a, 
we hope to be a part of every part of that mission. We plan to. We're working on the technologies for that, and um, we're very excited about that. Um, neither nuclear nor ion engines are necessarily new. There was a lot of talk, and uh, the original mm -hmm. ideas date from the 1950s, mm -hmm. uh, and some design studies and some tests were also done. Anytime anybody hears the word nuclear, they tend to get a little bit worried. Talk to us a little bit about what ion propulsion, nuclear propulsion is all about, and what are some of the other attractive sources that you guys are experimenting with? Well, if we look at um, a class of electric propulsion, which includes both ion propulsion and Hall effect thrusters, it's very, very high performance engines. Um, they they basically use xenon gas and ionize them, but they're um, if you use miles per gallon as a figure of merit, they're like t ten times more efficient than typical chemical rockets. So, you know, when you try to move things around and you want to move a lot of things around now you need a lot less propulsion to do it every bit of propulsion you use in in space you have to lift off the earth at this point so it, you know it has a real cascading effect in terms of both mass as well as cost so we're working on um, they have been around but they haven't been around at the power levels we're talking about we're now taking advantage of um, high power solar arrays the ability to manage power in space and therefore we're moving up the um, power levels of these engines and we're in the process of testing these at power levels that they've never been, um, we've never qualified engines for. And so that'll be one piece of the architecture that we hope will play a major role, you know, especially as NASA looks at cargo in space. And, and they have a great utility. You think of them as barges. You're gonna send all this material in a barge and then you send the people a lot faster because they don't, you know, you can take years probably with some of the, the supplies and things like that, but you don't wanna take years with the people. Nuclear is more applicable to the people side of it because you get high performance, not as high as electric, but you also get high thrust. And you need that to accelerate and cut the trip time down. And we think you can cut the trip time down, you know, 50%, possibly more as compared to conventional um, chemical propulsion. We obviously are working chemical propulsion backups in case the nuclear can't be developed in time or, you know, we don't, we choose not to develop that. And with nuclear, you know, it's an interesting power source. It's, um, yeah, there's a lot of um, people who will think, no, I don't want to use nuclear. But the real key there is really, can you test it safely on the ground and not have a problem here on the ground? And that's, those are things we're working with um, NASA uh, Marshall on right now. And what are some ways you guys can do that? Because, you know, almost everything else you can, mm -hmm. but this is spewing radioactive isotopes out the back end of it. So how, well, would, how do you... It's got to be a closed loop system. You have to catch what you're, you know, when you fire the rocket engine, it has to be a closed loop system, and there are ways to do that. So we're working with um, a number of companies experienced in um, nuclear power on techniques for doing that. But when you're in space, that amount of radiation doesn't really matter much, does it? No, it, no, I don't think so. <laughs> no, you have other things to worry about when you're there. Protecting astronauts, you know, is another key thing NASA's working on. It's not you know, critical to what we do, you know, and that's not our core business, but it's also a very critical thing that NASA's working on. And let me ask you one last question. Why is it so important to go to the Red Planet, as far as you're concerned, aside from being sort of a space geek sort of thing that we've always wanted to do? Why is it important for you, for the United States and humankind in general, to go to Mars? To advance mankind, to learn more about ourselves, to learn more about our planet, our universe. I mean, there used to be water on Mars, what happened to it? Um, how does Mars relate to us? It's, it's the, you know, there's, there's a different answer for everybody, you know, for different people. Some people it's inspiring just to be exploring. Some people you can't help it to explore. Others it's for scientific value. Others it's, this is what mankind is supposed to do. So I think it's a different answer depending on who you ask. Julie, thanks very much for the time and we're looking forward to those rocket launches. So are we.